How many hungry for the Word of God this morning? Are y'all ready? I want you to go in your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 7 on down to 11. This, this message really came into my spirit. And the title of my message is Knowing is Half the Battle. Knowing is Half the Battle. This message came into my spirit because I was watching... Uh, something on YouTube where a guy was at a football practice and he was at the practice and he uh, is someone that's very knowledgeable about the game of football and he was watching the coaches coach the young people and as they're coaching the young people um, he was just sitting there observing and then as he started talking to another guy he said I like it here I like it here I like it here at this school man and the guy said, why? Why you like it here? He said, because they're, they're teaching. He's, they're teaching. They're getting instruction. They're learning the game and how to, how to function as a player. Not just run plays, but they're learning the technique. I like it. I like it. And then he looked at the camera, and he said this, and it just hit me right between the eyes. And the Lord just kind of ministered to me. He says, because you know, knowing is half the battle. And when he said that, it just hit me. Knowing is half the battle. One of the things that we have to realize in our lives is that the day that you stop growing, that's when death sets in. And so in our lives, we constantly want to be growing. We constantly want to be gaining knowledge, getting insight into various things in life. Whatever your craft is in a job, whatever your, whatever your hobbies are within your marriage, raising kids, just living life. I want to constantly be growing, constantly edifying, and gaining knowledge and gaining understanding concerning things. Because the day that you stop growing, this is what Pastor James Davis looked me in the eye, and he told me, he said, the day that you stop growing, son, is the day that death begins to set in. And when he said that to me, it never has left me. And he told me that way back in maybe 1997. And I've always remembered that. I want to constantly be growing, developing as a human being, as a person. And then spiritually, I want, to, I want to constantly be growing. I want to gain knowledge and understanding. And it just becomes a part of your life. You gain wisdom. We've talked about that for a long time. You're constantly, you're never in a place where you can look people in the eye and say, I've got it all figured out. I know it all. You can't tell me anything. When we fall into that trap, we, ended up, we end up finding ourselves uh, getting in a deep, deep hole. But there are three areas that I want to talk about today that we really have to gain continual knowledge concerning. Number one is God. We want to grow in the knowledge of God. Number two, of yourself. You want to know when it comes to my humanity, and as a human being, I want to constantly be understanding humanity, understanding who I am as a person, and understanding who, who people are around me, constantly learning, collecting data and information so I know uh, the nature of man and what man is capable of. And we're going to talk about this. And then number three, we're going to talk about is our adversary. Understand that we are in this world and we have an adversary. There is a war going on. Am I telling the truth, y'all? There is a war going on. We have to understand it so that we have success. Because you and I attack the enemy in our knowledge, but he attacks us in our ignorance. In your area of ignorance, he attacks you attack him in your area of knowledge. He attacks you in your area of ignorance. That's why Paul said, we are not ignorant of the enemy's schemes and devices. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, don't turn there, but Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, 
It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people, he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they don't have knowledge. Their lack of knowledge, they're not acquiring it. It's available, but a lot of times they're not acquiring it. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're sensitive about this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, look what he says. We want to start off with this, God. We want to grow in our knowledge of God. He says, but what things were gained to me, these things I counted them he says, I count it lost for Christ. The Apostle Paul understood that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was very educated in, Judea, in uh, Judaistic traditions. He understood the times and seasons. He, he was someone that when it came to education and even his commitment to spiritual things, he was blameless. He's a person that walked around that had all of the credits in his favor, in terms of his worldly education, even in terms of Judaism. He understood all those things and was highly respected and highly regarded in his community. He was somebody had, that had it going on, y'all, and was very, very well respected. But then in this verse, in verse 7, he makes this statement. But what things were gained to me... These things, he's these, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the what, y'all? Knowledge of Christ. So this has become more valuable to me. My knowledge of Christ has become more valuable to me than my education, than all my degrees, all my doctorates. All my titles, all my positions, all my acclaim, all my worldly success, over all the things that I've chased after in life. He said these things. He says, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Has this become, this is what we need. It has to become our passion that I might know him, that I might, I don't want to just go to church. I don't want to just pray. I don't want to just sing the songs. I want to know who Jesus Christ is. This becomes your passion. It becomes something that becomes a driving force for you. And to get an understanding or knowledge of who he is, we don't just surf the internet. We don't just, you know, go to the latest conference. We don't just do this and, and the religious things. We, on a day-to-day -day basis, draw near to him through prayer, through fasting, through consecration, through our obedience, through our love for him. And we allow God to uproot all those other idols so that he becomes the centerpiece of our life. Can I have an amen, y'all? And he says here in verse 9, And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the Mosaic law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now look what he says in verse 10, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He said that I may know him, that I want to know him, I want to become uh, acquainted with him, and I want to be intimate with him, that he becomes a part of my life, that he is in me and I am in him, and that that becomes your life. It becomes a lifestyle. It's just not a religious thing that we do on Sunday morning, that Every day, you know that the source of your life is found in Christ. He says that I may know him. He says, and the power of his resurrection. This is part of knowing him. P part of knowing him is understanding the beauty and the power of his resurrection. His resurrection formed a, a, a way of escape from you, for you from your old Adamic nature. His resurrection gave you access 
to a, a high priest that forever lives to make intercession for you. His resurrection also helped you to understand that he can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. And if he overcame, you can overcame, overcome. You can overcome. His resurrection proved that there is life after death. That you're not, you're not afraid of your future. You're not afraid of death. Ooh, I feel this right now. You're not afraid of death. You're not afraid of it because you understand that that's an entrance into the most high place and that there's a place for you. So when the devil tries to scare you with death and he tries to make you afraid of death, you already know that the power of the resurrection is already dwelling on the inside of me because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life and no man comes to the Father except you cannot have an amen, y'all. And so what happens is you already know the resurrection power is already pulsating through your veins. That there's life in you. And the resurrection is already resident within you, that you might know the power of his resurrection. This is a part of knowing him and the fellowship of his sufferings. This is also a part of it. Christianity is also a dying out process. It is a dying out process. If you haven't figured it out yet, God is trying to kill the old Jew. So he can make the new you. Can I have an amen? God is trying to kill the old Napoleon Kaufman every day. So the new Napoleon Kaufman can emerge and people can see the righteousness of God that comes through faith in him. And that it's not me that lives, but Christ lives in me. That's the fellowship of his suffering. When God starts telling you no, and you like one of those young babies in the, in the grocery store that really want that candy bar. <laughs> Mama, I want it. I want it. Give it to me. And God, and, and God is saying, I know you want this. I know you want that. I know you're mad about this. I want you want this. You want that. But no, you can't have it. Because I'm trying that that that's driving you to want all that is is in some cases it's just your flesh acting up, and in some cases it's just a matter of timing. Maybe you can't have it now, but we still fall out in the grocery store. Said so we're not falling out in the grocery store. We're falling out in our prayer closet, and falling out on the altar, and falling out. And what happens is, God is saying, I'm not, I may not always be, God may not always be saying no forever, but he might be saying no for right now. Just a matter of timing. And what happens to all of us is we have to see that dying out process is a part of the fellowship of his sufferings. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you see Jesus' will for a moment in conflict with his father. Nevertheless, Lord, there's conflict. If, this, if it's possible, let this cup pass. He's just saying, just let, let this put cup pass. He, wasn't, he was willing to go before the father to see if there was another way, but when the father gave him no response, he understood that what he was commissioned to do, he had to finish the work. What does he say? Nevertheless, thy will be done. Nevertheless. And he goes forward. He doesn't fall out in the grocery store, y'all. So we learn that fellowship of your sufferings, there's a part of that. There's going to be part of rejection that you're going to experience from the world because they don't understand your new Christianity. They don't understand why you're always talking about Jesus. And why you're so passionate about Jesus and why you just love Jesus. They don't get it yet. But you have to understand if they keep on hanging around with you, what's on you is going to get on them. Can I have an amen? They're going to catch it. They're going to catch it. So, so there's, there's a part of that. There's a part of that, and there's a suffering aspect of that because sometimes we're around people that just don't understand the, the nature of what we've come into contact with 
And so for them, they call us foolish or strange or holy rollers or crazy religious fanatics. Now, understanding that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe. And that Jesus Christ has given us an opportunity to have a newness of life if we're willing to receive it. The train is moving. We got to get on the train, y'all. Can I have an amen? So, but we have to make the investment in this relationship. I want to know God. I have to make the investment. I have to make the investment with my time. I have, to, I have to make the investment with my time. I have to spend time with the Lord. If I want to know the Lord, I have to get away and spend time with the Lord. Man, I just feel the presence of God. I have to spend, the, spend time with the Lord. You have to invest your time. How many Oprah reruns are you going to watch? <laughs> Invest your, in your time with the Lord Jesus. You have to invest your temple. You have to invest your temple. What I mean by that is, is that if you want to know God, you and I have to understand that our bodies are his dwelling place. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to do anything in my life that would, that would cause him to not want to dwell in me. Can I have an amen, y'all? If I'm, if I'm going to invest my time, I want you to come into my life, Lord, and I know that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, then I want to do the best that I can to make sure I'm not doing anything that would defile my body and to defile and to cause your presence to not feel welcome in my life. So, I, you, so all of us have to take inventory. How am, I, how am I creating a resting place within me that God would feel welcome in? It's heavy. Because a lot of times we just think about God being out here. But do you think about God being in here? That your body is the temple. I have to invest with my, with my temple. I have to invest with my treasure. I have to invest with my treasure. What I mean by that is that when it comes to, you, generally we're w willing to pay for things that are of value to us, right? And so if I believe that uh, growing in God is going to take me getting a Bible, I'm willing to pay for a Bible. I'm willing to pay for two, one, two. I want one in every room, whatever, Right? I'm willing to make the investment. I, I want to bring, I'm going to bring my Bible to church. You say, well, I got it on my phone. Okay, well, praise the Lord. But at the end of the day, are you willing to make the investment? You know what? I wanna, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to church. And you know what? I'm going to buy this book right here that I know that has been recommended by the bookstore that's going to help me grow. It's amazing how we'll spend money on everything else. I'm saying this to myself. But do, but do we make the investment in those things that God is asking us to make the investment in that are going to help us to grow, that are going to help our relationship with him? So number one, we want to make sure that we gain more knowledge of who God is. That means it's going to take an investment of my time, my temple, and then my treasure. But we want to grow in our relationship with God. Look what he says here in verse 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. We talked about that. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection, he says, from the dead. This was a Paul. This was the Paul's perspective. It was his mindset. It became his lifestyle. So growing in the knowledge of God is half the battle. Now, I'm going to tell you about the other half, but growing in the, the knowledge of God is half the battle. Man, I want to get to know God. Why you go to church? Because I want to get to know God. Those people know God. They're going to tell me about God. They're going to they're focus on God. It's not about man. It's about God. It's about how can I get to know him? How can I, how can I develop more intimacy with him? It's a, part of, it's a part of God's process of processing me. I want to be in a church. I don't want to just be out here in the street trying to know about God. I need to get around people that know about God. 
and they're going to help me to know about God. And I don't think I know everything because I don't know everything. And I need to help somebody to help me to know because there are people that have been walking with God far, far longer than I have. And people are anointed to do what they do. God called them and anointed them to do what they do. They just don't just it's not just about their knowledge. It's also about the anointing because God has placed them in a position to help me to know about God. So I want to know about God. I'm trying to learn about God. I would not be here if it were not for strong local churches. I would not be standing up here if it were not for strong local churches and pastors and leaders who were able to talk to me. And that's why you always hear me talk about Pastor James Davis and talk about uh, Pastor David Canestrate. I talk about these people because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Well, brother, all you need is God. Well, no, I need God, but God teaches me how to need people that he sends in my life to speak on his behalf. It's been easy for God to go to Pharaoh and say, I'm about to bust you up, boy. You better let my people go. But that's not how God works. So I'm going to send a messenger that's going to speak on my behalf, is going to tell you exactly what I want done, and you're going to let these people go. Can I have an amen? God always uses people. He uses people. And so the local church is so powerful because God helps us in local churches to grow in our knowledge of who God is. But we have to be willing to fully embrace this. I need to know who God is. Go to Romans chapter 1. I want you to see this because what ends up happening for some people is they don't really value this. And in the culture, you see this, and it's a, it's a, a great error. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 to 32. Now, he's talking about humanity in chapter 1. Uh, verse 18 on down to 32, he's talking about God's wrath on the unrighteous and, and whatnot. But in verse 28, he's, as he's speaking concerning all humanity, he says this, And even as they, all humanity, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. Look at verse 28 one more time. And even as they did not like to do what, y'all? Retain God in their knowledge. Retain God in their knowledge. I want to grow in the knowledge of God in my life. But I have to understand the culture, by and large, does not want to retain God in its knowledge. We want to get God out of this. We want to get him out of the schools. We want to get him out of this discussion and that discussion. We want to get him out. We don't want God in. The devil is very good at trying to push God out of things. He wants to get God out of your marriage, out of your homes, out of your singleness, out of your life. He doesn't want God in your life. He, want, he doesn't want you to retain God in your knowledge. That's how the devil thinks. I don't want them thinking about God. But I love the Apostle Paul. He said that I might know him. He allowed God to come in and he retained God in his knowledge. It says here, this is a fight, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Don't push God out of your thinking, out of your processing. Don't push him out. Retain him in all things and invite him into every area of your life. You need God in your life. You need him in your life. He says here, as they did not like to retain God 
in their knowledge, verse 28b, God gave them over to a debased or reprobated mind to do those things which are not fitting. So what happens, and this is dangerous, if you keep on rejecting God, then, then God turns around and he lets you have what you want. He gives you what you want. You don't want me, so I'm going to allow you to be overtaken by a debased mind. And then what ends up happening is we see very clearly over here, and then people just do those things which aren't fitting. If you want to be wild like that, then just be wild. If you don't want me in your knowledge, and we see this with, all, with humanity, we see this. People are pushing God out. So you want a society like this? Well, then have a society like, a society like that. If you want to just keep doing it. I tried to help you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If this is what you want, he says he'll give a person over to what they're desiring. But look at the results. He says to do those things which are not fitting. Look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. Violent, proud, boasters. Now look at this, y'all. Inventors of evil things. A lot of times we, we wonder, okay, why did God allow that? They did it. Why did they recreate this bomb and blew it? It wasn't God. People are inventors of evil things. Stop blaming God. He says, inventors of evil things. Uh, he says here, um, disobedient to parents. That'll preach right there. <laughs> Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things, this is their lifestyle, they practice it, such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So if you approve of people doing this, you're just as guilty as the person doing it. And this is what we have going on in society. It's people are acting like wild animals. And they're saying... And they've rejected God in their knowledge. This is why we have to get to know God. Because he helps us to establish true righteousness that comes through him. And then he rids our hearts of all this filth that can, can uh, be very, very per pervasive. And we see it in the culture even now. Can I have an amen, y'all? Go, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because this is a, also a part of it when it comes to making sure that we, that we seek God. We retain God in our knowledge. We don't reject him because it results in a certain character, characteristic that will just corrupt a society. And we see that. Now watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6. Look at verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, our lower edemic nature, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not what, y'all, carnal. They're not natural. They're not carnal. They're not worldly. He says, But mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Somebody say strongholds. A stronghold is a fortress that has been erected around a lie in your life. A stronghold is a fortress that has been erected around a lie in your life. It's a stronghold. And so what happens is, if we reject God in our knowledge, 
the devil comes along and he starts sowing seeds of poison. And then when we believe those things and come into agreement, then he begins to create a fortress around your mind and in your heart concerning that thing, which ultimately is a lie. You're never going to make it in life. You're never going to make it. You're just stupid. Look at you. You're dumb. Somebody tells us that or the devil whispers that, you know, you, you're going to, you better watch it. You got to be afraid of everything. You're going to die. You know, everybody dies early in your family. You're going to die. You're going to die. You, you're just going to die. And then, and then a person comes into agreement with that and says, you know what? Yeah, I am going to die. Huh? And then the devil erects a fortress around that in a person's mind and heart, and then that becomes a stronghold. They believe the lie. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to fall off a cliff. The enemy comes along, and he starts whispering these things into people's minds, and they believe them. And as a result of that, a person becomes overtaken with a stronghold, and then now that becomes something that when God is trying to get through to you, it's hard to get through because you don't believe the report of the Lord. I know I'm preaching right now. You're believing the lie that the devil has told you ever since you were little. And so now you think you can't stop. You can't stop smoking. You're going to smoke your whole life. And it's a lie from the devil. It's a stronghold. You got to allow God to break the stronghold. Somebody say, break the stronghold. You, got, you, you can't believe it. You can't believe what the devil is saying. When the truth comes along, the, he says, it's not my word like a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. His word comes along and he begins to smash the stronghold, smash the stronghold, smash the, can I have an amen, y'all? He begins to smash the stronghold so you can start thinking the right way and retain God in your knowledge. You talk to certain people, I've talked to certain, even people of different faith, and it's, it's hard to get through to them because there's a stronghold in their life. Even from a religious standpoint, talking to other, other people that are involved in various religions, I start talking to them, you can just think they just got a stronghold around it. They just will not accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he rose from the grave on the third day. They don't want to receive it. It's a stronghold in their mind. Well, we have to come along and cast down these strongholds and make sure that when we're fighting with people, that we understand that this person, don't hate them. They just got a stronghold. I see it. Let me keep chipping away. Can I have an amen? He says, are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against what, y'all? There it is. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The, the devil doesn't want you to have the knowledge of God. So there's, there's reasonings and arguments and strongholds in people's heads that cause them to be resistant to the message that is being preached. Resistance to the change that God is trying to bring into their lives. But here it is very important that we realize that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not fighting from a carnal standpoint. Stop arguing with people at the grocery store. It's not going to work. And I've been telling y'all this for 20 years. I tried it. It didn't work. I'm fighting in the Bible bookstore with people, fighting over here, fighting over there, arguing with people. And after a while, God would just tell me, would you just shut up, sow the seed, and move on? I mean, God had to get that in my head. Stop it. If they don't want to receive, okay, I tried. Okay, I left. I tried. I'm out of here. And what happens is some people, they're agitators, and they just want to fight with you. Stop fighting with your family members. I know I'm preaching now. I'm, I'm prophesying now. Stop arguing with your family members. If they don't want to receive what you have to say, well, say, well, praise God. Okay, pass the, pass the ketchup, man. I don't want to talk about this no more. Pass the ketchup, man. <laughs> he says here, 
Look what he says in verse 5. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of who, y'all? So this is what happens. When the reasonings and the arguments go forth, what we have to learn how to do is settle our minds and bring those thoughts into captivity, those thoughts of doubt concerning who Christ is, doubt concerning who he is in your life, doubt concerning what he's going to do in your life, doubt concerning if he's really real. Those feelings, those thoughts of doubt are going to come. We have to cast them down, bring them into subjection to Christ and bring it into subjection and obedience to Christ. Get your mind. Don't let your mind rule you. Don't let your thoughts get away from you. Don't let your thoughts cause you to drift off into something that can bring destruction in your life. Cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And then bring it into captivity and cause it, bring it back into the obedience. Shake yourself. Snap out of it. Don't get stuck in a mental rut. Learn how to change, turn the page. When, when the devil starts getting you to try to drift or to think on things too long, learn how to turn the page and get your mind redirected on other things. Start looking to the hills. Start getting your mind up. Start telling yourself, I'm more than a conqueror. Start, start saying, you know what, the, the devil, you're lying. Shut up. I'm moving on. God is good. Today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will magnify the Lord. I'm going to bless him. You start, learn how to get your mind off center. When you're in those moments where you find like you're in a mental distress and there's a wrestling match going on. I love this because it's so important. He says, in every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You take the thought captive. You come back here. Give me my mind back. Yeah. Ooh, I like that right there. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, take your mind back. The Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. Don't let your mind drift off into some foolishness. And help yourself. Stop looking at all the nasty videos and, and pornos and all this other filth that's getting your mind drifting off onto. I know I'm preaching now. Where are my amens at? Get your mind right. Get it back into alignment with Christ. I can't be looking at that and getting involved in that. I'm not going to be doing I got to get my mind right. I'm bringing it into captivity. And that way, my mind can be stayed on him. He will give you perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Can I have an amen, y'all? So this is where it starts. We have to pursue God and understand the battle that we are facing. And we have to take these thoughts and bring them to captivity and keep our mind on Christ and focus. He is our focus. I want to know God. Number two, I want to know myself. Go to Galatians chapter 5. We, we saw this before in Romans chapter 1. But I want to break this down just a little bit further. Galatians chapter 5. Now look at this. I have to know myself. I want to know God because knowing is half the battle. I want to know myself. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, on down to 25. It says in verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are the manifestation of your old Adamic nature are evident, meaning they're clearly seen. You can see this in the, in the life of people. He says, which are, he says, adultery. He says fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. When you see this, this is the manifestation of the sin nature, our old endemic nature. This is what you see. He says lewdness, 
So when we're seeing this so pervasive in the, in, in the, in the culture, on television, on radio, on, you just see this is just fallen humanity on display. He says here, uh, lewdness. Look at verse 20. Idolatry. People are so idolatrous. They can't go anywhere without their rabbit's foot. Or their crystals. Or they have a little, a little Buddha in the corner. And, or a little, little Mary sitting there in the corner. I can't go anywhere without saying, talking to Mary. Mary can't hear you. There's only one mediator between God and man, and it is the man, Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen? amen. Peter, Paul, James, John, Andrew, none of them, they can't, they're not, they not coming to hell. But when you call on the name of Jesus, <laughs> woo, my goodness, I feel that. And to me, I mean, this is real. It's not, I mean, I know we're kind of chuckling about it, but this is real life. People are stuck in idolatry. He says, but this is a manifestation of the work of the flesh. He says, idolatry, he says, sorcery, witchcraft. Witchcraft is so, even now you just see it, now it just becomes so mainstream. Witchcraft. He says, not only sorcery, Hatred. People just hate people for just hate them. It's just so sad just to see the hate. And then the hatred that you have even between the races. It's just so stupid. All of us come from Adam and Eve, man. And we're sitting here fighting over, over all this. And nations have been enslaving and hurting each other since Cain and Abel. Since Cain and Abel, brothers have turned on brothers and sisters, have, and, and you just see they're just fighting. And now, now cultures don't like these cultures, and that culture doesn't like this culture, and, and then they pick it on you, and then, they, and then they're picking on them, and then they're fighting them, and then one brother will turn on another brother, and then another brother will turn on another brother. Because this is the nature of man. It's fallen humanity. It's not a black or white thing. Black people kill black people every day, and white people keep white people every day, and Hispanics kill Hispanics every day. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a humanity thing. It's a deadly evil. It's wickedness. It's the fall of Adam. It's, the, it's Cain and Abel. The cloak is it's a black and a white thing. That's the cloak. The real issue is we need to be born again. Our nature needs to change. Can I have an amen? That's the, that's the real issue. And the devil, he wants us to swing over here at the branches, but the gospel is designed to get to the root of the matter. We all must be born again because there is a resident evil that God is trying to uproot from our lives, and we got to drive it out through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Who I feel this. And so what happens here, he says, hatred. Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. He says envy, murders, drunkenness. We see this. Revelries and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's just not going to happen. You can say, that pastor over there, they're just not loving, and they're preaching against sin, and they're, they're telling us to stop, and they don't understand my plight in life and what I've been through, and blah, 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 blah. You can say, you can, say, you can bring that accusation, but you just read what I just read. If this is a lifestyle that you practice, you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't write this book. 
And my job is to make sure that I'm saying what God has already said. And But the good thing about it is that all of us, God gives us space to repent and get our lives right with him. And he gives us an opportunity to experience life and that more abundantly through the power of the gospel and the blood of Jesus. Can I have an amen? I'm so grateful for the power of God. I'm saying this because what I'm reading to you was me. What I'm reading to you was, is you without God. What I'm reading to you is humanity. What I'm reading to you is helping us to understand the knowledge of who we are without God. I have to know who I am. I have to know who I am. If, if, if I have to know who I am outside of God, if I keep going down the same road, there's going to be a manifestation of these particular character qualities in my life in some way. You may not see all of this, but you might see some of it because it's just the nature of man. Well, we have to know the old us. And say, no, you're not getting the best of me like you did before. Can I have an amen? No, no, no. We're not going to be fornicating like I used to before. We're not going to be out here in the streets with revelry and and drunkenness. Well, we're not doing that no more. Because I know who I was outside of Christ. And I'm not deceived by this. I have knowledge of this. I once was blind, but now I see. Can I have an amen? Y'all going to make me. Woo! I almost ran through that wall, y'all. I almost ran through that wall, boy. Woo! I was blind, but now I see. I don't have sorcery and witchcraft in my life. But I can see it now. I can see it. I can see the manifestation of it in people's lives. And people think that they, that they can continue to do this, and it doesn't matter. They can still make it to heaven. But that's not what the Bible is saying. And he says this, he says, but the fruit of the spirit, the manifestation of God's spirit in your life is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Somebody say self-control. By the power of the Spirit, you can control yourself. Pastor, I just couldn't help it. Yeah, you could if you would have tapped into the Spirit. He says, against such there is no law. What can anybody say to you if you're living like this? If the manifestation is, is, is clearly evident in your life of God's Spirit, there's no charge for that in the sight of God. God says you're free. But we, what we do is we allow the manifestation of this in our lives. He says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh, which is passions and what, y'all? Desire. And it's their lust. I let the, the Lord kill the old me. And so as a result of that, the Lord has taught me is teaching us how to walk in the spirit so we don't fulfill the lustful desires of our flesh. He says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This becomes our lifestyle. So I know myself. I know myself. I know myself. I know what the old Napoleon Kaufman is capable of. I know who the new Napoleon Kaufman is. I'm not confused. And if I'm living in this life and I happen to let the the, uh, old Napoleon Kaufman rear his ugly head, I know how to say, God, I confess my sin. And as I confess my sin, I know that you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. And cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I'm still on the parter's wheel. I know you're still working on me. But I'm not going to act like it didn't happen. I'm going to confess my sins. 
and I want to make it right with you because I'm trying to be who you are designed me to be. I don't want to be the old Napoleon Kaufman anymore. I want the new, can I have an amen? I want the new one to be on fire for God and this is what I want. So Lord, cleanse me and wash me and make me stronger. Can I have an amen, y'all? If you fall, confess your sin and get up. Let God continue to do what he's trying to do in your life. And the last thing is Ephesians chapter 6. So I know myself. Ephesians chapter 6. I want to know my adversary very well. We're going to close it out with this. And this is, this is so important. I said Ephesians, right? And these pages are stuck. Come on, man. I'm having... <laughs> there it is. Let me get this here. I got this new Bible, and I'm about to break it up. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. (laughs) You got to loosen that baby up. (laughs) Look at verse 10. Now look at this, y'all. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Stop looking at everybody as if though they're your enemy. They're not your enemy. The devil may be using them. But understand that you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. He says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Understand that the devil has a satanic hierarchy. And his desire, his desire is to is to uh, pervert God's creation, corrupt them from the inside out, tear up humanity. He was rejected and kicked out of heaven, and so his whole desire and goal is to destroy God's creation. And so you are a target, whether you realize it or not. And you, there is no middle ground You're either on the Lord's side or you're on the side of the enemy. There's no middle ground in this battle. And when it comes to your life, if the devil puts enough pressure on you, he can get you to do things that are contrary to God's will because you don't have any power to resist him steadfast in the faith if you haven't received the Lord Jesus. Jesus gives you power to overcome the pressure of the enemy. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, you shall receive power. God gives you dunamis. He gives you the ability to resist the devil that he might flee from you. But if you don't have the Spirit of God in your life, you don't have the power to resist. Your own human will can only work for so long. The enemy is stronger than you. So this is why you need someone stronger than him in your life. (laughs) Who equips you with his armor so you can fight back and you can learn how to resist the devil that he might flee. But there's a lot of people, they want to stop, but they don't take the lifeline that God gives them. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. It seems right to them if I, just, if I just take some more pills. It seems right to them if I just drink a little bit more alcohol. 
It seems right to them if I just smoke a little bit more, smoke a little bit more marijuana. If I just smoke more weed, then I'm going to make myself feel better tonight. It just feels right to them if I just have another, another shot of Jack Daniels. Don't worry about it. I'm going to be good. It just feels right, not understanding that that, that seems right, but it leads to death. It leads to destructive forces entering into your life. Man, I'm preaching this morning, y'all. This leads to destructive forces. So that's not the answer. The answer is that God will fill you with his spirit. And then he filled, woo, I filled it. He filled you with the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit helps to uh, give you the power to overcome your old sinful nature. And then the power to resist the devil. And then God gives you the ability um, to come out of your circumstance and situation. And then now you're not looking for a substance to make you calm. The rest of the Lord comes upon you. Then you start telling yourself, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can go on this job. They're getting on my last nerve, but I got the power of God in me. These demons through people are trying to come at me, but, I, but they can't stop the power of God that's in me. I'm not going to wilt. I'm not going to faint. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to leave this job. You're not going to drive me out of here. I'm right here, and the power of God is in me, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is guarding my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus, and I'm going to walk. I'm going to talk. I'm going to be exact. Exactly who I am. You can't get me to shut my mouth. You can't get me to stop talking about the Lord. The Lord is the one who sustains me on this job. And he's the one who makes me in this house. And he makes me in this marriage. And he makes me on this place. It's the Lord that gives me the rest that I need. I'm good in him. Ooh, I feel the anointing on this. Somebody need to stand up and praise the Lord right now. Because we getting some knowledge this morning. We getting some knowledge this morning. We getting some knowledge. I, I don't want to go to church. I, want, I just want to go to church. I want to get some knowledge of God. I want some knowledge of who I am. I want some knowledge of how to fight these devils that are trying to take me out. They can't win because my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But I'm getting my knowledge. I'm getting my knowledge. You can sit in your seat all you want, but I'm getting my knowledge. You can stay at home and go golfing, but I'm going to go get myself some knowledge. You can go fishing, but I'm about to go get me some knowledge this morning. I'll meet you on the back end. I got to go get my knowledge first. Come on, clap. Woo. Woo. I'm getting my knowledge. Where are you at on Sundays? I'm on church on Sunday. I'm going to go get me some knowledge. I'm going to go meet with the saints of God. I'm going to go meet with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to get in his presence. And I'm going to grow. You can die if you want to. You can be destroyed if you want to, but I'm going to get my knowledge. I'm going to get my knowledge. I'm going to keep on reading this. I'm going to keep on reading it. How many times are you reading it? I don't know. I'm reading this thing thousands of times. I'm going to keep on reading it. What chapter? What books? I read them all. I don't care. Old Testament, New Testament, a book of Proverbs, book of Psalm. I don't care. I'm reading it all. It's all good. It tastes real good. It be getting down, way down into my soul and making me feel good about my life and about what God is trying to do in my life. How many times you going to read it? I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read it again. How many times you read the book of John? I'll read it a thousand times because this is how I get my knowledge and I'm going to grow. Man, I need to stop. I need to stop. I need to stop. I need to stop. Oh, I need to stop. This ain't even on my notes. That ain't even on my notes. I... Saints, we've got to get to a place in our lives where we stop playing church. And we take this stuff serious. People are out here in these streets dying every day. And the devil is beating people up, tearing their lives up. And God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. For lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The knowledge is half the battle. You taking what you just heard 
and practicing it. That's the other half of the battle. I gave you one half, but I can't just leave you with that one half. I got to tell you the other half is you got to take what I'm saying, you got to apply this to your life, and you got to take this out in the streets, and you got to practice this stuff. Because what I'm saying to you, the devil's going to test you on it. Oh, you shouting in there right now. But are you going to practice what that preacher was saying? That's the other half. The knowledge is the one half. Putting it into practice is the other half. I'm going to work this out. If you fall and stumble, my prayer is it never happens to you. If it happens to you, repent. Don't wait. Repent. And then get back up. Don't quit. This Christianity is too hard. You know, it's too hard. It's too hard. Hell is hot, y'all. I'd rather suffer now and reign later. Can I have an amen? I'd rather, I'd rather fight these demons now and then reign later for the rest of my existence than to mess around and pity myself and think, you're not the only one that's ever been tempted. Jesus showed us the way. Let's take it and put it into practice. Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen? Father, we thank you this morning. Knowing is half the battle. And we praise you for the knowledge that you are releasing over this congregation this morning everyone under the sound of my voice. We want to grow. We want to gain more and more knowledge. That just, just doesn't happen here on Sunday morning. It happens every day in our personal lives. Lord, continue to speak to us and teach us your ways. We want to be like you, Jesus. Thank you for the gift of salvation. We give you all the praise. Anybody this morning that wants to respond to this, this message and you know that there's areas where God is saying I need more of you in these areas so you can get more of me in these areas I want you to come down to the altar so we can pray with you believe God with you the presence of God is here what an awesome opportunity to grow in the grace of God to grow in the grace and the knowledge of who God is. God bless you all for tuning in this morning. Everyone else, thank you for being here. Come on to the altar. We want to pray with you this morning.